Today in our national news, we tracking a story from Oregon's Weinmai National Forest, where there is a major search for Derek and Gebretsen. On December 5, 1998, the eight-year-old boy, along with his father and grandfather, went into the forest in search of a Christmas tree. Derek was never seen again. Some tone folks says it been rumored that aliens could be the responsible for the missing eight-year-old boy. More on this story coming up. There are thousands of people that are coming up missing or oftentimes just totally vanished in our national park forests. A lot of these stories are just mysterious in certain ways that they go unsolved. But who could be taking these people? Who could be abducting them when thousands and hundreds of people are searching for these individuals using helicopters, dogs, radar, uh, search and rescue teams, all with sophisticated technology to find someone who is lost. But unfortunately, they don't. And you may be thinking, why a UFO investigator is talking about missing people in the National Forest? Well, I'm glad you're thinking about that because the story you're about to hear in the video today, you may not believe it. I'm Roderick Martin. I'm the host of the YouTube channel, High Strangeness, and I want to welcome you to the High Strangeness show here on Forbidden Knowledge TV. The story you're about to hear, especially if you're a parent, is going to shock you. And so therefore, prepare for the story. And as we get to the end, we're going to go over some of the evidence and we're going to talk about, I think, a profound hypothesis, maybe as a theory, of why some of these people cannot be found. Our story began with Derek Eberton who came up missing December the 5th, 1998. Now, if you're a parent, this is gonna be a shocking story. So prepare to hear this story. But in the end, let's look at our hypothesis or our theory on why he was not ever found. Now this happened in the Winema National Forest sometime in the afternoon of December the 5th, 1998. Now, Derek Iberson and his father, Robert, and his grandfather, Bob, who was 64 at the time, set out to a densely wooded forest mountainside above Klamath Lake. Now this lake was located about 30 miles north of Klamath Falls. Now they planned to find a Christmas tree for the holiday season. Now Derek was never seen again. Now because of his love of outdoors, Derek was known as bear boy at the age of eight years old. It's not uncommon for a young boy to follow his father and grandfather into the forest. His backstory is Derek, a week after he was born, his mother had carried him on a bear hunt in a pack. Now in his youth, he hunted with his father and picked mushrooms with his mother's father. And on several of his mushroom expeditions, he had visited Pelican Butt. Now this is located east of the Cascade Range in South Central Oregon, which is lies Upper Klamath Lake. So he's been up in that area before where he came missing. A large shallow freshwater lake is what's located in this particular area. And it's gonna be significant in a little bit in the story. So just keep that in mind. A little bit about Pelican Bluff, it rises about 3,800 feet above the shore of Crater Lake and is in a steep, kind of a steep sided uh, dormant shield volcano, uh, which is located 28 miles south of the crater. Okay, so we're talking about a steep hill and we're talking about water and everything else, okay? Now, the Egerton family did not plan to get a Christmas tree this year. They decided that uh, it was just going to be a little too much trouble. And although Robert looked forward to his family Christmas tree hunt every year, it was his wife, Lori, who convinced him to use an artificial tree this year. Lori wanted to keep the mess to a minimum, but when a disabled neighbor asked him for a tree, Robert went on into the woods. Now, Bob remembers telling his father that since it was already after 2 p.m., it would be dark around 4 p.m. since it was late, uh, in the year as he was driving along the West Side Road in his red Toyota pickup. Now on his way to uh, the Rocky Point Resort, Bob pulled into a turnout mile at mile post 12. The three of them 
climbed up on an embankment into the pine forest after Robert helped Derek get into his what we call blue snow suit. Derek walked behind Robert, so just kind of see how this is working out, and who told him to stay with his grandfather, Derek was nagging like any other young boy. Like, Come on, Pops, I, or, or Granddad, I want to be with Dad. I want to uh, go whatever. So Derek nagged his grandfather that he wanted to catch up with his father as he chopped the small trees with his hatchet, which is another significant part of the evidence that we're going to be talking about. Derek had his own hatchet as he was emulating his father chopping trees. He was a little upset that he had to stay behind. So he's telling his grandfather, come on, let me catch up with my father. Let me catch up with my father. So that already tells you that the father and the, and the son and the grandfather were separated a little distance apart as they're walking through the forest looking for a Christmas tree suitable for the neighbor. Now we can think, okay, this is already setting up to be something a little eerie going on. At some point, the, the grandfather said, okay, forget it. Go catch up with your dad. You're getting on my nerves. And the boy headed up in the search of his father within the darkness closing in. So it was already now getting dark because you remember it gets dark at 4 p.m. where they were going so this is pretty early so now the little boy runs off into where it was getting dark and if you think about woods when you're looking up you don't see the light coming through because this stuff gets really dense and and so it's going to be dark in there but they let the little boy go run up to catch up with his father where his grandfather said okay go ahead and do it when bob and and, and robert meets up one of them asked, where's Derek, which was his father, because he's looking at his grandfather, like, or his dad, like, where's Derek? And his grandfather, which is talking to his son, says, well, I thought Derek was with you. So as a parent, you already right now is going like, holy cow, even listening to the story, now this boy is now officially missing. Now, despite the steady falling of the heavy snow, wet snow, Robert turned back up the hill and he called out to Derek. Derek, Derek. You know, he's frantically looking for Derek, Derek, his son. Robert flags down Fred Hines. Now, a motorist he was driving along the road around 4.13 p.m. Now, he requested him to dial 911 so that the authorities could be notified. So in a resort, which is about two miles away from the area where Derek was vanished, Haynes made the call. So he had to drive about two miles to get to the nearest phone. And we're talking about this was at 4.13 p.m. So you got to remember early in the story, they already said they were setting out there around two something, a little after two, and knowing that it was going to get dark around 4 p.m. and they needed to hurry up. So now at 4.13 p.m., this is when he stopped this guy. Over the course of two weeks, hundreds of people searched through several feet of snow using snowmobiles, dogs to search and rescue for Derek. Now, Lori, which is Derek's mother, now she slept in a donated camper van at the turn point. Now, she was hoping that Derek would see a bonfire and come to her. Now, what she's thinking is, all right, since it's at nighttime and we're talking about being in a forest where there's no light, if I sit out here at night while everybody else is sleeping and I'll light a big bonfire, Derek, who's been in that area before, you remember, could probably see it at night. Now he can probably find his way to something and not be lost because he may see the campfire and he's going to come to there. So she's thinking, uh, let's do this. Let's see if it's going to attract him. And I think that's a wonderful thing, uh, a good idea on her part, especially as a mother to say, listen, when it gets dark, he's going to be looking for light. And why not? He's going to be looking. He doesn't have a flashlight, so he can probably see light and this will be one of the great ways of uh, rescuing uh, my child then she thought she saw Derek right so she thought she saw Derek waving at her and smiling at her when she was delirious and from a lack of sleep so she was already having hallucinations uh, because she just as a mother just wasn't sleeping at all why right? during the day she's looking for her son then at night she decides that hey i'm still gonna stay up 24 hours and and, and burn this bonfire because i want to find my baby and you don't blame her for that right and so yeah she got a little delirious and she thought that she saw him and of course they knew this wasn't happening and like i said unfortunately this was not the case Derek's tracks were found by Robert and other members of the family in the newly fallen snow in the hours immediately following his disappearance. Now, okay, so a few hours after this, they found his tracks. So apparently either he was still wandering around 
or maybe he got off the trail. And this was kind of a little thing that kind of threw me off a little bit because at this point, uh, he would have had some tracks at that point. But well, let's just say it just starts snowing, like they said, once it, it got in the evening when he became missing. So obviously he was still out there wandering about or something else. Now, according to what they said, uh, wherever they had last seen him or his footprints, they then noticed that he did a snow angel. If you know what I'm talking about, laying in the snow, doing your arms and hands. And so apparently he was there near the road, which makes sense for a young boy knowing, hey, if I'm lost, let me just get down to the road is what we were thinking at this point. There had been a snow plow that came by and the tracks leading away from the angel was obliterated. So they now lost what they thought they had some evidence. And there was no tracks leading toward the woods from the angel. And so a small area of the trees near the road was damaged by Derek's hatchet cut. So he was out there cutting things himself is what they're saying. Now the father was confident that the son did not re-enter into the woods. So he's like, he found his way out, he made a snow angel, and now he's not going back into the woods is what they're thinking. So early in that evening, five to eight inches of snow had fallen on the rocky point. So you know now any tracks are being covered up any kind of way is going to make this a little more difficult for them to find this young boy. A candy wrapper also was found, and whether these items belong to Derek, they really just didn't know. Now, Derek's family believed that he had made his way to the road, like I said before, and was probably picked up by a stranger. But this explanation was dismissed by the sheriff department because they're like, no, this didn't happen at this point. Now, whether they looked for him or not, or maybe they called ahead and checked the roads, or maybe they had cameras, but they really dismissed it pretty quickly, which also raised a lot of alarms because why wouldn't they just suspect that if they did see evidence that him by the road? But other than that, I don't know much more information on this particular part, but it's worth going further along into the story. Now, Bob discovered a hole in the ice in the lake and a child's footprint on the bank during the search. So at this point, think about a lake that's frozen over. Here's a hole and here's a footprint, not feet, a bunch of footprints, but a footprint right by the lake. So assumingly at this point, you're terrified, right? You would be. You're thinking in Bob's, which is grandfather's like, what? There's a hole in the lake. There's a footprint. Oh my God. He done fell into the lake. So now it's a whole new ball game. So the next day, divers, bunch of divers searched that area again. And in addition, the searches was carried out during the spring as well when it thawed. So they didn't find him. They get into this cold water. They're looking for him. They didn't find him. So they figured let's come back into the springtime. So now we're talking months done went by and no, uh, no one has found this young boy. And so they said, let's go back when the water thaw out. Maybe we can see clear. Maybe we can find some things. However, nothing was found. Now, Lori and Robert was informed by Clement County authorities that their son was likely dead eight days after Derek disappeared. So at this point, they've already given up. They're saying, hey, there's no way that this boy could be alive out here in this forest eight days later. And during the next seven days, Robert and Lori, about 100 other volunteers, they stayed on the mountain. You're talking hundreds of people looking for this young boy. Now, speculations, it started getting really rough. Now, minds and people are going everywhere. As you know how it works, people start, you know, maybe it's this fault, your fault, this fault. So speculation intense that Derek has been kidnapped now, because this is the only way. We can't find him. Somebody must have took him. When the sub-zero temperatures forced the Egerbertons to end their search for their kid on December the 18th, this is about 13 uh, days or so after he came up missing. Now, Robert drove straight from his uh, graveyard shift at work to the mountains to meet Lori every weekend for the next two years. Could you imagine every weekend, you know, after his graveyard shift, him and his wife would meet at this, this, this wilderness park, National Forest, and they just said, we're gonna continue to look for our son. And this went on for two years. Can you imagine the pain and everything in that family, what was going on? The search areas was marked on a map and it was widely believed that the authorities was too slow to arrive to the scene that night when Derek disappeared. Now, like I said, a lot of criticisms became uh, pretty evident in this deal. And this was one of them because they were saying that it took too long to begin the search and rescue 
which had it begun in ample time, he might have been found. Now, here's some of the reasons why people were saying this. According to the records, the search did not begin until nearly five hours after the first 911 call because the coordinator was reluctant to interrupt a Christmas party at the Molly's restaurant from the annual awards dinner of Clement County Search and Rescue Team before it was a certain that a rescue was needed. Think about this. They're having this big event that night. All of the search and rescue people are there for an event of awards. So nobody's really out and about. Everybody's clustered at this one spot. And the coordinator who's over it felt that, wait a minute, here's your here's a call that came in, search and rescue, and everybody's right here. So now you're talking the whole Navy SEALs of swimming ducks. Everybody can just go right out there and find this kid had they then, you know, set sound the alarm. But it took them five hours because whoever it was decided, I don't want to break the party up. Man, nah, maybe it's not a search and rescue. Wouldn't that be the perfect time for all of them to come together for that one moment and say, what? Now we have an award. Let's go get that award. Let's go find this young boy. Somebody made the decision, an executive decision. I'm not going to interrupt the award ceremony to look for this young man. What about you? Would you have been ticked off? I know I would. I would have been ticked off. Now everybody is under investigation. Despite passing polygraph, Robert, which is his dad, Bob was also suspected of murdering Derek or having been negligent in some kind of way. I mean, everybody's now you're talking, everybody's a suspect. And despite his father's insistence, Robert couldn't speak to him. So Robert, who is the father of Derek, could no longer speak to his dad, right? Because now this is it formed a wedge between them. The reason why is the blame for not finding Derek went to him, but the blame for losing Derek went to Bob. So the father is now just taking on this emotional trauma of not being able to find his own child. I'm the hero, I need to find my son. But he's also blaming his father for not keeping up with Derek. So now he's blaming himself that he can't find his son and I'm gonna blame my father because he didn't, or he lost my son. Now you're talking three generations of pain right here that's going on. This is an incredible emotional story. Now as time went by, the Egersons was just so overwhelmed with guilt, they didn't even wanna talk about this anymore. Now Robert was on a leave from work for several weeks. Now Derek's family spent thousands of dollars uh, looking for him, paying for psychics. I mean, they even went to psychics and also a boat to search through Clement Lake and they eventually went bankrupt. Now, meanwhile, the authorities, who's gonna be covering their you know, behinds as well, Claim Derek was wandering off into the woods and he died. His remains has been scattered by animals. But check this out. However, the Ingerberton family never really believed that because especially since no remains or torn clothing had been found. There was a witness who said that they seen a man and a boy struggling on the highway nearby. Then the story takes a little twist. In 1999, graffiti was scrapped on a rest area bathroom wall near Burn, stating that Derek had been killed and buried. Now this later on was ruled a hoax by the FBI. Now the story takes on another twist. A boy named Derek, who was found in Texas under unusual circumstances, looked a little like the Eberson son. So somebody in Texas surfaced looks just like him but it was actually a different person so you can think about the let down there and after several days of waiting for a confirmation a bone discovered in pelican buff back where he was missing in 2000 was identified as being from a deer so you can just think about the ups and downs you get word that possibly there's a guy a little boy that looks like your son way in texas because they already thought that he could have been kidnapped by somebody off the highway if you remember there was a story someone said they saw a boy struggling the story of the the the, the angels that he was making uh near the road all of these things and now all of a sudden something in texas that would just drive you nuts and then come at that same time they finally find a bone in the area. Now they've already searched before and they didn't see this. So now you kind of like, what is that? And turns out it was a deer. In late 2001, the family received a handwritten letter and it read, I know who took your son. And on July 11, 2000, Frank Milligan, a 31 year old state youth authority worker, approached 
a 10-year-old boy at Dallas Park and offered him $100 to mow his lawn. In the Milligan's car, the man asked the boy, do you want to live or do you want to die? Teach your kids not to be approached by strangers, even if they put money on the table there. That is crazy. Now, the Milligan uh, bound the boy's hands and duct tape and then forced him to walk down a dirt road and sexually assaulted him. Now, the Milligan choked the boy, slammed his face into the dirt so hard that he blacked out, and then he cut the boy's throat and left him for dead. Now, despite the odds, the boy woke up covered in blood. He got to a road where a passing motorist uh, stopped to help him. Now, during the attack, the Milligan was out on bond or bail uh, from a Clanstop County Jail. Now, he was accused of sexual assaulting an 11-year-old boy in 1997. Uh, in a letter to police and the Egerbersons, Milliken's cellmate admitted that Milliken had abducted and killed Derek. And the letter arrived at the Egerbersons' home in late 2001. So once again, somebody's in jail. He's telling his cellie all the things that he's done. He's probably, again, saw this in the news, or maybe not, or maybe he's the killer. And so he admitted to killing this boy, but he was out on bail for sexual assault. And I don't know about sexual assault, but I know when I hear about a lot of this, they say that is just something that it's in them, it's in them. So, you know, letting that person out like that, now he does it again. A detective from Oregon State Police who investigated the Dallas case confronted Miller. So he was already working on the case where Derek Eberton came up missing back in Oregon, and now he's in tech. Frank Milligan confessed to killing him. So he said, I killed Derek. And he agreed to lead investigators to his body. So the FBI used ground penetrating radar to scans for Derek's bones at the Silver Lake Falls Park, southeast of Salem, where Lori and Robert drove for five hours. So now he's saying, I killed the boy and brought him into a whole nother state and his, his body is over here. Parents hear about it. They drive five hours to find their son's remains. They want to bring closure to this tragedy in their lives. There were no results after several days of searching and an assistant district attorney told the Ebertons that Milligan had agreed to plead guilty to killing Derek in the, if they spared him the death penalty. After Milligan was presented with the paperwork a few days later, he refused to sign it. So as we come to some of the conclusions here, if Derek fell into the lake, his hatchet was most likely to be there in the water, and it could would have indicated that the boy had died in the inlet there where the hatchet would have been into the settlement because the hatchet would have fell down into the ground. Jeff Priest, a diver from Portland, spent several hours looking his way through the shallow water using a metal detector designed for underwater incursions. And the, they found like an oil filter, a metal road sign among the metal objects that was found in there. And however, they did not find uh, Derek's hatchet. And there's a lot of questions. Was Derek Eberton abducted by Frank Milligan? Or maybe it was another pedophile that did it? Or now, as the sheriff believed, or did he die from the cold weather? Because remember, it's ice cold. Or was it maybe some animal attack? And, and is there any other reason why Derek Eberton died that fateful day in a sad day, December the 98? And the case is certainly one of the most mysterious cases out there. So let's go into why we're here. And I'm talking about being a uh, UFO investigator. I'm talking about uh, me saying, Roderick, you know, you've been on TV shows, Fox Tubi, I've been on, you know, Forbidden Knowledge TV, uh, Black Knight Satellite, featuring on Ancient Aliens, you name it, Coast to Coast Radio, Gaia, uh, you know, I want to believe one, I want to believe two, I've been in shows, Bigfoot, you know, all of these shows, when it comes down to alien and extraterrestrial from abductions and everything else. David Pilates, if you heard Missing 411, who's done many stories on the missing, began to tell his stories that, you know, he believed that there is a UFO connection if you start thinking about it. So let's look at Derek's story, number one. Number one, he went ahead between his father and grandfather uh, to catch up with his father and he came up missing. Now, apparently to the story, there was not any snow going on at that moment, so therefore it's not foot tracks here. But then this guy, this little boy comes completely missing. Now, the challenge into this is when these people vanish in these national forests without any, any uh, reason whatsoever, 
they cannot find any tracks, clothing, any remnants of some of these people. So even Derek being out there, you know, what could possibly have did this? What has the technology to evade hundreds of people searching, ground sonar, search and rescue people, dogs, helicopters, and these people are searching miles and miles of terrain or within a Pacific area where this young boy just vanished completely. Now we can go back to the story of the snow angel uh, and we can kind of say, okay, Roderick, he, he uh, made a, a snow angel and maybe somebody did pick him up off the road. And I was a little kind of concerned. Why would the sheriff department say, well, you know, we rule that out immediately. Maybe it's something on a dangerous road or maybe because so many people vanish in these forests that they already have an indication of what they know was already happening. Therefore, they were not gonna put the resources in saying, we're gonna put time to go search, uh, looking for this young boy on the highway where he came up missing in the National Forest and there's been speculations. And so when you think about the alien connection, it'll be a perfect place for them to find subjects for their experiments. Young kids have always probably been a delight for them to say, hey, let's study something that we can then raise and continue to, you never know. I'm just speculating uh, up on this, but it's just a situation. And we talk about portals, we talk about cloaking device, Bigfoots and all these things being able to dis disappear, tracks in the middle of nowhere. So the National Forest, we will be the perfect place if you're going to say, hey, I'm gonna to abduct a few people. There are many stories that of children being missing right in front of their families, just turning their heads and they're gone. Or what could have the technology or what could have the ability to make something or someone disappear like that before your eyes and become untraceable. This is another one of those stories. Uh, when we get down to it, could there be again, these folks out there doing this in our, our national forest. And why is it a lot of people not paying attention to it? How come it's not thousands of people coming up missing every year and just totally vanish within our national forest? I'm Roderick Martin. I could have go deeper. We got more videos about this. Um, I'm doing plenty of these stories and there are some more that you want to hear. Subscribe here to Forbidden Knowledge TV uh, and then also come on over to uh, Roderick's Martin High Strangers and, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.